Good morning, good morning. The Out of Bounds Show, ESPN 105.9 The Zone. We may put Scott Frost in the Out of Bounds Hall of Fame. We'll see how it plays out throughout the week. Right now, he's my favorite coach in college football. But, I mean, Harbaugh stepped up yesterday. I love what he he posted. Smart and uh, had the stones to throw that out. I thought Ryan Day was good. I thought Coach Saban was too. So maybe we have a shot here. It's gonna be. It's gonna come down to the players, which then filters up to the head coaches if we have some some college football. But I love some Scott Frost and uh, Harbaugh, Day, and Saban. So right now, those are my my guys that I'm riding with. It could change. Uh, any any hour, minute to minute. Live in the Bank Plus studio, the show is presented by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Mississippi. It's good to be blue, the official health care provider of the Out of Bounds Show. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Mississippi. We want to welcome in our friend, National College Football Analyst with ESPN, Tom Luganbill on the Parish Brewing Hotline. Lugs, good morning. How are you, buddy? I'm good, buddy. How are you doing? It's good to be back on with you. Well, thanks for doing this. I know you've got a, a busy morning. And I uh, appreciate you changing your schedule. This is uh, wild times, huh? I mean, we don't uh, – over the weekend, we thought the Big Ten may cancel. They haven't yet. And then you have you have one school at least go rogue and, and uh, allow their head coach to go out and do a press conference and say, well, if we don't play here, uh, we want to look at all our, our other options and play somewhere, somewhere else. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you, the shame in all of this, and this relates to the players too. In the you know the I want to play hashtag is something they could have gained players and coaches alike if you'd started this six weeks ago, yeah. all right? And you had this push from those that are inside the building day to day, your athletic trainers, your medical professionals doing everything they can to create a safe and healthy environment, knowing what the risks are, doing everything they can to minimize the risk, and continuing to tout that, continuing to push that, having the players get involved publicly by saying, hey, listen, this is what we're doing every day. There is no better environment or atmosphere for us to be in to keep us safe. We're prepared to play. We want to play. All of these things that we've heard over the last 72 hours are fantastic. I just become concerned that it's too little too late in regards to gaining enough momentum to, you know, create the change necessary for this to happen. And I'll tell you the other thing, too, Bo, that, that bothers me about all this. And, you know, it, it doesn't matter what political side of the aisle that you sit on. I do think this thing has been weaponized. I do think it has been politicized. Sure. But here's the reality of the situation. You could kick the can down two weeks. You could kick the can down the street six weeks. You could kick the can down the street eight months. Guess what's not changing? Coronavirus. It's not going away. It's going to be here. It is part of our society, just like all the various other strains of coronavirus that we've seen in the past. So it doesn't matter if they have a vaccine. A vaccine doesn't automatically change this. Uh, We have a flu vaccine. People still get the flu. And you know what? People still die from the flu, unfortunately. So the reality is that we're going to have to make some societal changes. We acknowledge that and realize it. Has everybody bought into that to the level that they probably should? No. But it doesn't change the fact that if you want to sit here and talk about, well, if we start the season in October or we start the season in January, everything is going to be different. No, it's not. The only thing that makes it different is our day-to-day conduct and the preparations that we make, not just athletically or in terms of the sports, but in our society to minimize the risk. Because that's all we're doing here, Bo. Right. We're trying to minimize risk. And we know what the risks are. So what are you willing to risk to move forward? Tom Lugan, Bill with ESPN on the Out of Bounds Show. Tom, I thought you nailed it a couple of minutes ago on players and coaches coming out several weeks ago and and starting to rally and lobby instead of, you know, the last day or two. What what we started talking about at least two weeks ago, Luke's, was why were people not talking about how successful student athletes um, back on campus had been since June fifteenth? Like that was not leading anywhere in the you know it wasn't going to lead on CNN or Fox News. But had we had a bunch of positive cases, yes. But 
as far as we know, uh, every student athlete had recovered. But you weren't hearing anything about how successful the universities slash athletic departments, protocols, guidelines, and safety measures had been starting three or four weeks in, and now here we are. Well, it's because it doesn't fit a certain narrative. Um, you know, the when I when I look at this thing, and, and really, I remember this past summer when some of these schools were releasing <clears throat> that they had had some positive tests. They were releasing the, the amount of times that they had tested and the number of positive results. And I remember vividly, um, and I think I can even still get the, the number right, North Carolina had released. They had tested 428 people. 37 of them came back positive. 28 of the seven were asymptomatic, didn't even know they had it. So my, my point in all of that when we were discussing it is, what is the acceptable number of positive rates? We, there's no getting around accepting that there are going to be positive results. So whether you're a bureaucrat, whether you're a president, whether you're a head coach, whether you're an athletic trainer, whether you're a medical professional, is there some number out there that nobody really knows what it is because they're maybe too worried about being held to a standard if they say it publicly, but what is the number? What's the percentage rate that is acceptable for everybody to say, okay, they've done a really good job minimizing risk, locking this down, slowing it down, flattening the curve, if you will, Nobody knows what that number is. I'm in North Carolina right now. Our, our governor has decided that they want to extend uh, uh, certain measures, phase two measures, mask wearing, and the delay of competition for fall sports athletically uh, another, I think, seven to 10 days. Now, this was a little over a week ago, all right? And they stated that the positive return rate of everybody tested in the state was 6%, all right, 6%. And you want to know what the number was that they said, well, we want to get it to this number before we want to open up and move into phase three. Phase what? Three. The governor said 5%. Are you kidding me? He didn't say 1%. He didn't say 0.5%. They're shutting this whole thing down from 6 to 5. And so when you, when you apply that... Well, for so many because of the precautions and all the different rules that have been set in place and the standards that have been set in place to protect these student athletes, I don't know what more you can ask anybody to do. I just don't, I don't know what that is. Well, all right, you were, were visiting with Tom Luganville on the Out of Bounds show, ESPN 105, down the zone. Uh, Lugs, you were a, a student athlete um, at both the junior college and Power 5, G5 levels. So, you know, I, I think this is where you were going maybe via Twitter or something, but Saban hit on this yesterday. Uh, you believe without a shadow of doubt that, that athletes are much more safer on campus than at home. Right. Oh, I do. I certainly believe that, and that's also going to what uh, lead into what I think Greg Sankey, the commissioner of the SEC, is doing with the steps that he is taking. Is the bubble, if you will, and there's no such thing as a 100% protective bubble, but the measures then put forth, the ability to to keep the kids all in the same dorm, the ability to keep the kids in the building, to obviously disinfect, do all the things, the mask wearing, everything that's part of that, you know, I don't understand what other safe environment you could put them in, but here's what is going to happen. And this is where I think the SEC is being smart and slow playing this. They're anticipating that when normal student athletes or students and normal students and the rest of that population come back to school, that you know what, there might be a spike. There, there might be an uptick in some positive cases. So by extending out the start, I think, what is it, September 26th? Yes. They're figuring that you have that group come back to campus. And again, this isn't an exact science. They're projecting here, and they're both based on their medical professionals. And the regular students come back to campus, and all of a sudden, might you have a little bit of a spike. Well, now that builds in that 14-day 
quarantine period, the, the, the whole period to try and get past that period and still not have a delay to start the season. And they don't want to cancel when they don't know what the answer to that is yet, which I totally understand. Sure. So this is about to become not just a student athlete issue. It's about to become a student population issue with, with the number of positive tests, if there are going to be an uptick, if there's going to be a spike, nobody knows that. They're, they're preparing that there's going to be, and that's why they set this specific window to wait and see. I mean, that, that's why what the Big Ten did was a complete and utter sham. Oh. Last, Wednesday, last Wednesday, you come out with your schedule, you're set to go. All of a sudden, over the weekend, you up and decide that there's – not to be any football to be played, and the commissioner of the Big Ten son plays at Mississippi State. Yes, he does. And he made the comments on Thursday he would he was good with his son playing college football. Luke, I know, I know, I know. So <laughs> now this is going to be interesting. If first, if the SEC and one other conference holds the line, ACC or Big, maybe all three, but let's just say. The SEC, if they decide to go, would like someone else to go with them, uh, whether that's the Big 12 or the ACC or, again, all three. It will be fascinating to see if the Big 10 pulls the plug, if some of their schools look, and other conferences, Power 5 conferences play, Tom, if they look for other options outside of their league. How unprecedented would that be? In terms of the individual respective teams? Yes. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. You're, this is going to create utter chaos, and not just short-term. It could create it long-term. And I'll tell you the other issue that we've got to acknowledge here. This is, this is the most devastating issue, in my opinion. And I talked to an SCS coach of a prominent SCS school yesterday that told me that if they don't play, if they don't play, they may not be able to field a football athletic program for three to five years. That's how devastating the economic impact of all this is. Now, that's not just at the SCS level. That's certainly going to also have an impact at the Mid-American Conference level, which is already called their football season, the Group 5 level, Mountain West just called theirs. That Not having that revenue um, is, is so catastrophic that – Nobody knows or really wants to talk about what the long-term ramifications of that are. I don't – I agree. I don't think the Mountain West survives. Um, well, here's another one. How about this? Think about it in these terms. Here's another area that people aren't addressing. If they don't play and they allow all of their players to get an extra year of eligibility, you have now uh, – it's now instead of having the scholarships you're accustomed to having – you're going to have an extra 25 on top of that. Some schools can't pay for that. No. Uh, we're trying to figure out if Southern Miss could make it. Um, Mississippi State and Ole Miss will be able to make it because of their affiliation with the SEC. Well, of course. But uh, Mountain West, even Boise State, who is kind of a darling in the G5 deal. Um, and then we start to look at Troy, Southern Miss, La Lafayette, La Monroe, La Tech. I I don't know how that looks. And, and, and also, Tom, I'm not buying that they're, they'll be able to play in the spring. I, I, I don't think, as you started, I think you started our conversation with, hey, Bo, you know, the coronavirus is something that we're all going to have to live with forever and yeah. ever and deal with and manage. And as you said, uh, uh, manage risk. I don't know how we're going to come out of the two coldest months of the country in January and February and think that, it's all going to be okay, and they can just fire. They can basically start practice mid-January, which is cold. Practice yep. for four to five weeks, and then boot this thing up March one. Luke's. Well, the biggest problem in all of that isn't really weather. I think you know if you're if you use the month of January as training camp, everybody's got an indoor facility. They can manage that. You might have some cold games to start the season. All right, so what? We have a bunch of cold games to end every season. The bigger issue in all of that is you're going to have every single senior or underclassman opt out that thinks they're a draft-eligible player. Even if they're not, right. we've talked about this before, you have an awful lot of players that have an overinflated opinion of what their actual ability level is. So if they even think that they have a free agent grade, 
from the NFL. You think they're going to play college football in the spring and miss out on the NFL draft? No. They're not going to do it. And here's the other issue is what is the NFL going to do, all right, if you have players, let's take Trevor Lawrence, for example. Under the current rule, you have to have played at least three seasons of college football. All right? Well, what if you have a Trevor Lawrence that's played two? Is the NFL going to change that rule? Yes. Or are they going to make him go back? I think they'll change it, but I think where you're going also is, will the NFL change their schedule in the spring because of college football? And I don't think that they will because the NFL is staying on schedule right now. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if you had a change, could you push the NFL draft back a month? Yeah, you probably could. It wouldn't affect mini camp. It wouldn't affect your your training camp start time. I think you could probably do that. Um, but, again, it goes back to what I think is the core of the situation, and you referenced what I said when we first came on air. It, it, it doesn't – we're not – everybody's under this assumption that if we move it back, you don't deal with the virus anymore. That's – that's a complete falsehood. That's a myth. And, and, it's, and so what we've got to acknowledge is no matter when we decide to play, the risk is there. You do everything you can to combat the risk, right? You acknowledge that there are going to be positive results, and you're going to have to deal with that. Um, because if we never get to that point, then how do we even function in society as a whole, period? Right. Forget athletics. I mean, this is this is something that is very that is obviously is is far reaching. Uh, Tom Luganbill, ESPN on the Out of Bounds Show. Uh, Tom, how disappointed are your colleagues that you talk to, uh, former players, people in broadcasting, coaches, and others in the Big Ten's leadership or lack thereof? Um, I think we're all frustrated because we feel like when something like that happens, it lights a fuse. It becomes political. Nobody wants to be the last one to say, no, we're, you know, we're digging our heels in. So now, you know, there's a tendency to cower to pressure. Um, You know, all of those things stem from one power conference making a decision. And I think the frustration and what we talked about is the mixed messaging how do you go from setting your schedule, being ready to roll? You know, your kids are on the field, you're managing that. And in a matter of 48 hours, you're hearing rumblings over a weekend that a vote's going to happen to not play. I think that that's created a lot of frustration. Now, is there misinformation out there? Of course there is. Sure. Is, 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 there, is there more to all of this as we talk about with just about everything in, in college athletics? The devil's always in the details. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are. So, uh, I, I think it's not even, you know, from our standpoint, from a broadcasting standpoint, you know, we, a lot of people may not realize that we have the technology as a, as a company, and so does CBS, so does Fox, so do all of them, to actually broadcast games without being on site. Like physically broadcast the game, and unless you knew what to listen for as the, as the regular fan, you might not know that we weren't there. Mm-hmm. All right? So, we have all of our parameters for safety that are, are being worked on by the people way above my pay grade to be able to function and produce broadcasts. But, you know, that takes away from us being in the role that we're normally in, you know, not being in the environment, not being on the field, sure. not being uh, in the booth, you know, having to do something in more of a sterile, stale environment. But you know what, if that's what it takes to do it, then that's, that's what we're going to do. And, uh, but, you know, so no, nobody's happy about this. It's not ideal. You, you've got to roll with the punches and you've got to figure out, you know, how, how to make things work. And it's not just at the conference level. It's at the broadcast rights level, too. Uh, do you think your son will have, college, uh, will have his football season this year? No, it's interesting. I would hope so. They are on tap to still have it. They are right now. My son's a rising ninth grader. Um he is going. They are doing their their practice schedule three days a week. They have all the parameters. I've seen it set in place. They've done an excellent job. Um, they've been on the field since July sixth. Have not had a positive result. Um, but again, too, the thing that we've also got to acknowledge about all of this, Bo, and you asked us about high school, but it applies to college. 
what age demographic is the least at risk for not only contracting coronavirus, but having symptoms from it? 20 to 25. Absolutely. Okay, so that that should be a positive. That should play into the favor of trying to continue to manage and 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 and, and get on the field. And and I would have listen. Um, I as a as a parent, as somebody who was a former coach, as somebody who's in the the football broadcasting profession that's around it every day, um, on the recruiting side as well as now getting involved with my my own son entering into high school, I, seeing the measures that they've put in place. I would have no problem with, with him playing football, none whatsoever. And, um, and that's just, that doesn't mean that's everybody's opinion. It right. doesn't mean, but I'm not, that to me is not political. It's my own personal opinion on watching. Now, if I sat there and looked at our high school program and wasn't very pleased with how serious they were taking this and not putting in the, the necessary measures, yeah, then I'd have reservations and concerns, but they haven't done that. We'll leave it there. Tom Luganbill, National College Football Analyst with ESPN. What time are you on TV today? So we, you know what, we're extending College Football Live for an hour today. So we'll be on uh, 4 to 5 Central, 5 to 6 Eastern on ESPN2. I think it's myself and Des Howard. And then, um, but, you know, obviously it's Tuesday. There's been a lot of speculation that stuff's going to be taking place today. One of the reasons why we extended it from a half an hour to an hour. So we'll find out. We'll see. And, you know, a lot of my commentary here will, you know, probably be mirrored on, on, on that program based on the topics we choose to talk about. Thanks, my friend. We appreciate you. You bet, man. Thanks for having me. Tom Luganbill, National College Football Analyst with ESPN. He joined us on the Parish Brewing Guest Line, and we appreciate Luke stopping by today. He was scheduled for 930, kind enough to uh, jump on at 730 with his TV hits later in the morning. So there we go. Um, the SEC and Commissioner Sankey, Commissioner Sankey comes out yesterday and says, look, we're continuing to move forward. We're trying our best to gather more information every day. The reason why we moved it back was because of what Tom just described. Students coming back on campus. Look, We'll see what the wave looks like. And that's why September 26th, they felt like worked. Evidently, the Big Ten threw out September 3rd and never had any intention, any intention of playing, which, uh, man, that's frustrating. That's poor leadership. That's bad, bad leadership. I mean, I understand we make, we make some, we make wrong decisions, but they never had any intention of playing football. And now the blowback is Ohio State, which is the big dog. They're Alabama, but bigger in the Big Ten. And Michigan. And then you've got Nebraska and others saying, oh, no, we want to play. And we may find another place to play. Your thoughts on the Mississippi Ag John Deere tractor text line. 601-885. 3776 885 3776